We're very thankful that the Lord enabled us to be here where he is. We often, I often lose sight of that. But that makes up for it all, doesn't it? Yes, um, I have been dwelling on his presence in the assembly. When we think of God, we can, Psalm 139, for instance, begin, uh, begins the first six verses with presenting God as the all-knowing God. He knows it all. Our circumstances, our feelings, our emotions, our needs, he knows it all. Thou hast set me behind and before, the psalmist says, and thou hast laid thy hand upon me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou knowest my thoughts afar off. I believe it says thou understandest my thoughts afar off. The next six verses present God as the omnipresent, present everywhere at all times. And that is, that's a precious thought as well. Paul says, oh, to know him. Well, then the, th the third aspect of God is presented in the verses 12 to 18, and we have God there as the all powerful God and he is available as such when I was thinking of the sweltering heat I thought of the words now he must needs go through Samaria must needs and then now Jesus weary from the way he had come sat down on the well just as he was so he is entering into all our circumstances. I made a little introduction while you were gone about God, the all-knowing God, the all-present everywhere, and in the last, the all-powerful God, the omnipotent. And this was in connection with realizing that the Lord Jesus is here in our midst. And I was dwelling on Matthew chapter 18. Would you please turn that, please? Matthew chapter 18. Wherever there is something for God, Satan is present. And it is possible by any one of us, when we are not close to the Lord, to be a tool in Satan's hands. By, what do I mean by that? In spreading defilement, in grieving the Holy Spirit of God. And I think of a verse in Hebrews 12, verse 15, where it reads, Watch ye. We are to watch out. And if we fail there, then it slips through. Watch ye, lest any man, any sister, any brother, lack of the grace of God. And as a result, a root of bitterness springing up among you, many be defiled. And it does say in Ephesians 4 verse 30, grieve not the Spirit of God, wherewith you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So this is just an example. I would take the time to read most of the chapter. Maybe we can spot read. Verse 1, that is the condition of the soul that would seek to bring honor to self. Like here in verse 1 of Matthew 18, we read, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus. That was wonderful. But saying, 
who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Makes me think of the apostle Paul who had been taken up in the third heaven. He had special revelations and he says, lest I be exalted above measure, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. And then again the second time, lest I be exalted above measure. And so this was at the bottom of it all. We can learn from this. You see, it is this chapter, 18 of Matthew, and what we read there in verse 20 that makes us certain that the Lord Jesus is present here tonight. It does say, for where two or three are gathered together unto my name, it is the Lord Jesus himself speaking, unto my name, there am I in the midst. Now this is very precious to the Lord Jesus to be here. To be with some that f for whom he has died, for whom he shed his blood. But you see, we were speaking of God as the all-powerful God, but um, how we need that. I think of the tool that God in this very chapter gives us as a means whereby we may well, I was going to say defy, overcome the attacks of the enemy. And in verse 19, preceding verse 20, we read, were two of you. This is not three, this is two. Were two of you. Agree. Agreement can only be reached by the Spirit of God. Where two of you agree on a few things, on anything you shall ask, that is all-inclusive. And that opens a, a, a sphere where we act on this verse and we have access to God and we have responses from God. But this is in connection with his, him being the gathering center. Where two of you agree on anything that you shall ask, it shall be done of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst. See? So, agreement. If I ask you to come up with um, a passage from Scripture, I'm sure we'd all say, Oh, Psalm 133. Behold to God. How pleasant it is that we are here. How good and how pleasant it is that brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. Agreeing in unity. And then there is a picture of the Holy Spirit. It is like the oil that ran down upon Aaron's beard and that came to the hem of his garment, the hem of the high priest, the band, it had alternately a golden bell and a pomegranate. The golden bell speaks of testimony. The pomegranate speaks of fruitfulness. And so this is what God would see in each of us under the control of the Spirit of God. And when you speak of a beard, I just shaved tonight, but then you think of maturity. I see a lot of our younger brethren there in Grove City, and they're all sporting some hair, some place here, you know. And, uh, but it is a, an, an, a proof that they are growing up into manhood and we may pray for them and we do so this just as an introduction i was going to read some verses and here i'm still talking verse one we just read 
who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus called a little child unto him, not a teenager, not a young man, not even an older person that would be humble. No, a little child. The Lord uses those, you know. And he set him in the midst of them. That little guy must have been kind of shy and embarrassed. However, I'm sure the Lord held him. And he is the one, the Lord Jesus, who said, Allow the little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. So he called a little child and he put him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child. At the age of 12, it is recorded that when his mother said, Child, we have sought you, I believe, either three to five days, sorrowing. And paraphrasing it, why have you dealt thus with us? And the Lord Jesus, as a 12-year-old, he answered, Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And so even as a young person, we may be about the business of God our Father. And then he went home with them, and he was subject unto them. Yeah, a lamb without spot, outwardly and inwardly. Perfection, sinless perfection. Paul the Apostle speaks of the Lord Jesus, and he says, He who knew no sin was made sin for us. The Lord Jesus knew no sin. And Peter, he was always the spokesman, so to speak. And he was a man of action. And he says, the Lord Jesus, he did no sin. And then there was John who laid on his bosom and very intimate with the Lord Jesus. And he said, in him is no sin. So this sinless one was raised and yet in a way that we can't understand, we must just accept the fact that he is here. And he ch challenged the multitude and said, which of you convinceth me of sin? And he, we are not sinless, but there is a means by which we may stay in full communion and communication with the Father. If we confess our sin, our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just verse 5, And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones who believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged out about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. And then there is a general warning here by the Lord Jesus, Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it, you have the little word must again, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. You see, this here whole chapter is full of these exhortations. And we would have thought that it would have been better to have another chapter where these offenses wouldn't be mentioned. But no, it is here where Satan attacks. And, but there is a remedy, beloved. And we'll look at a few verses in a minute. 
Then I would like to skip a few verses. Um, yes. I'm going down to verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother trespasses against thee, go and tell him his fault between him and thee alone. Perhaps you're different, but an automatic reaction would be to get even and to defend ourselves. And perhaps to share it with one that I have confidence in. And you have all heard about um, an illustration that I think it was a preacher who tried to teach a young man a lesson that he shouldn't tell tale. And he took a great big bag full of feathers and he climbed a big mountain. And there he let go of all the feathers and it was blowing like mad. And those feathers, they went everywhere. And he says, now see if you can gather them up. And that was an impossibility. That is why we have to go whenever we feel that something is between a brother or a sister and myself, then this has got to be cleared up. We cannot say, oh, we'll just forget it. No, the Lord Jesus here instructs us. Moreover, in verse 15, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. You see, these uh, sayings are, well, shared with uh, two dispensations. The old dispensation of the law, but also the church, which would soon, under the coming down of the Holy Spirit, begin, and of which we are an inseparable part, the assembly. And so they were to um, take one or two witnesses, for in the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything shall be established. And the result, uh, uh, but if he would neglect that, then he was to be treated as a heathen man. We cannot apply everything, but we can learn tremendous lessons here. And then we get... To verse 19, again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. I would like to go back to verse 15 for a minute, because you'd say, yes, but this suggests that verse 15 that my brother has trespassed against me but what about when I have failed you see and in Matthew chapter 5 we have the other Matthew would you turn there please Matthew 5 I think it is verse 23 But I'd like to read verse 23 in its context. That is always very important. You can pick out a verse and say, oh, here it is, and this is what it means. But we should see it in the connection with the foregoing verses and perhaps those that follow. Uh, verse, um, verse 19, whosoever, this is of Matthew 5, verse 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then there, in the following verses, verse 22, But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother, it seems so trivial, just anger, when God is angry with us, you, you say, is that possible? Well, Moses kept on stalling it off when he was sent to Pharaoh, and it says that God was angry with Moses. And the last thing that you hear about Solomon is, and God was angry with Solomon. So that is possible then. But here, verse 22 of Matthew 5, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, or you are a vain fellow, shall be in danger of the council or the Sanhedrin. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. See, we can't apply all these verses because of those two dispensations that met there. But in that connection, that is why I took the time to read them, in verse 23, therefore, we have looked at the wherefore. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift, an offering in their case, worship in ours. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother has ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. I looked up the meaning of the word reconcile, and it's, it's a beautiful uh, thought that is expressed with that word reconcile. Made right, yes, it means distance and animosity removed totally. Then we are being drawn together around the Lord Jesus. Behold how good and how pleasant it is that brethren dwell together in unity. See? So, agree, verse 25, with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him. And then there is verses of exhortation. Now, could we turn back to Matthew 18, please? We've come to verse, including verse 20. I've often marveled at the fact that after that, after the end of that beautiful verse that were two or three are gathered together, in my name there am I in the midst, there is that, oops, there is that little verse then, or that little word then, then, that very moment, then, spoke Peter. Came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often, how oft, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? And maybe he acted. Can you hold your, your place here and turn to Luke chapter 17? And we'll compare those two passages. Luke chapter 17, verse 1. We all arrived. Verse 1 of chapter 17 of the Gospel of Luke. Then said he, the Lord Jesus, unto his disciples, It is impossible except but that offenses will come. How we need to watch. Watch ye, lest any man lack of the grace of God, and a root of bitterness springing up among you many be defiled. That was the quote from Hebrews 12, verse 15. Verse 2 of chapter 17, It is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea, than that he should offend 
one of these younger ones. Take heed to yourselves. I'm inclined to take heed kind of you. I come last. That is, I examine naturally the acts of my brothers and sisters. And while I, I haven't been before God, let a man examine himself. That thought. Take heed to yourselves. I believe that is also in Acts 20, verse 19. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock of God, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the flock of God. See? So take heed to yourselves, otherwise we can't function in that area either. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, that is, face him with it, between him and thee alone, and if he repent, forgive him. We read, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us. Then it says, and if he trespass against thee seven times, no, seven times in one day. Turn again. Turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. I was dwelling on Habakkuk, who said in verse 1 of chapter 2, I set myself on my watchtower, and I will see what he will say unto me when I am reproved of him. And then he says, The just, those that have been made right with God, the just shall live by faith. And there is three times that that quote from Habakkuk occurs in the New Testament. In the one passage, it is the emphasis, it is in Hebrews, on living, live by faith. In Romans, I believe, it is live by faith. And, yes, the just, oh, yes. And then in Galatians, the thought of the just is the reason why that verse is quoted by these holy men who spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Remember, Peter declares how the scriptures came together. And these several writers all refer to Habakkuk's statement, the just shall live by faith. And so, Lord, increase our faith. But there's another aspect, and that is when we come into the presence of God. What do I mean? I mean in the holiest. It does say, having therefore, there again, you have a therefore, there. what is the wherefore there? Oh, it says, their sins and their iniquities. Iniquities, we looked it up today. Shall I remember no more? Now, where remission or forgiveness of sin is, there is no more sacrifice for sin, the next verse says. And then it says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near. How? The way God maintains us in holiness, with a true heart and in full assurance of faith. See? Increase our faith, Lord. So, back, maybe Peter thought of this statement. Maybe he was uh, there when it was said by the Lord Jesus seven times in one day. But here he prays, or he asked the Lord and said, Lord, but then Peter said, what if my brother trespasses against me seven times? Shall I forgive him? 
Is there a limit? Was there a limit in God's forgiveness toward us? No. And so, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven us, that is the God standard, and he wants it to be your and my standard. And I thought uh, we might have referred to that the other day, last Lord's Day, when we spoke of Psalm 93. Thy testimonies are very sure, the last verse, holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. So back to Matthew 18 for a bit more. And then the Lord answers. And Jesus said unto him, verse 22, I say unto thee, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. And we mentioned that too. And we would have the tendency to say, oh, 70 times 7 is 490. So if it's 491, I don't have to forgive anymore, you see. But no. And then the Lord Jesus, in connection with the foregoing, tells this parable of a man who owed a lot of money. And, and a debt that could not be touched you couldn't begin. Let's read. Verse, um, yeah, verse 23. 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, and isn't that a picture of you and I when we came with our burden and we prayed this short prayer, be merciful to me, the sinner. That is what the man prayed. He was a tax collector. He had joined the enemy of his nation and he was stealing some of the tax money and he was in the temple and there was another person there that was righteous, self-righteous and he told God how good he was and what he had done while the other pleaded for mercy and the Lord Jesus says that last man who said be merciful to me the sinner went home justified, made right with God. And so this man here is really experiencing something like it, something that no human being could pay, as it were. How he had accumulated the, the debt, I was thinking there of the last verse of uh, the book of Jonah, where God uh, remonstrates with Jonah and says, how can I possibly destroy the city of Nineveh? But they had repented, of course, since there are a, a hundred thousand that cannot discern between their left and their right hand. And so God's mercy is inexhaustible, indescribable. And here, 10,000 talents each talent is 750 ounces of silver. Now, if you multiply 10,000 times 750, what do you get? Seven and a half million ounces of silver. And then, that's not the end of it, because each ounce of silver is eight pence. A pence is a day's hard work. He gave him a pence. So we have eight times seven and a half million is 60 million. Days of hard work that would pay that debt. And the Lord Jesus comes in this setting of offenses and in the setting of being in the presence of his blood-bought saints. 
and he comes up with this kind of a debt to remind us that we owe the debt that he didn't owe and that, that we couldn't pay. And then, you see, I, th I think I figured it out. Do you know how many years that is? That is 165,380 years. You see, we haven't entered in into the forgiveness that he gave us. And we're clean and we're, we're right with God. But this now in connection with his presence. And holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. We've looked at the two instances. If thy brother has trespassed against thee, go and tell him his fault between him and thee alone, and you might gain your brother. And the other one, if you realize that you, your brother has something against you, then leave there your gift. And that is right when we are giving to God, which Satan wants to stop. And that is when we are to lift, leave that gift at the altar and go and be reconciled with our brother. Yeah. So, but then, verse 25, but for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children, and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I'll pay thee all. And then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him barely three months' wages compared to that, the debt that we just described. This is a pittance. And he laid hands on him. He took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest me. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw that what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. And then his Lord, after that, he had called, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredst me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors. I would like to read a few verses in closing. Um, 1 Peter chapter 1. And we know the verse 18 of by heart. For as much as we know that we are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained from before the foundation of the world, but he was manifest in these last times for us, who by him do believe in God. And then the next verse I want to read with you. And this is an incentive it, it is not a suggestion. It is a command of God towards us. I used to be a drill sergeant, and I was pleased. I had such a relationship with my men that they couldn't do enough for me. I was the younger sergeant, and yet I had the best platoon because there was units in there. And may we 
feel the bond here. I am in Second Peter here. Now, verse 22. That is what I came to. Seeing ye have purified yourselves. First John 3 says, um, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. And then the last part of that quote is, Every man, it does say there, that we shall see him as he is at his appearing. Every man that hath this hope in him, let him purify himself even as he is pure. Scripture speaks of, in the same chapter, six verses down, righteous even as he is righteous. And then First Peter 1, be ye holy as I am holy. What a standard. And so seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, the oracles of God. How? Through the Spirit. The result? Unto unfeigned love of the brethren, of the brothers and sisters. See, as an end result, see that you love one another out of a pure heart, fervently. Double mention of love, double mention of purity. And now I would just close with John chapter 14. John's Gospel, chapter 14. I have dwelt on this. You know, the last verses that we read there in First Peter speak of love. If we, it, Ephesians 5, 19 says, be not, no, verse 1 of chapter 5, um, walk in love even as Christ has loved us and has given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice unto God for a sweet-smelling savor. That's, that's how we are to walk. What a standard. And we just fall down and say, Lord, we know what you want us to do, but we cannot do it in self. Overrule. And by the Spirit, enable us to bring glory to your precious name. Now here, these verses are also about love. It is John 14, verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I shall love him. And I will manifest myself to him. And that moves me to think that if I am obedient, obedience is better than sacrifice, and to hearken in the fat of rams, the choicest offering, fall away when it comes to comparing it with um, obedience. And here, um, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. And you know, I visualize myself sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus alongside of Mary. And I'm sure that he spoke of himself, that he manifested himself to Mary. And if we have a desire to do the same, it's a God-given desire, and it is already answered. So I will manifest myself to him. And then note the next ver uh, no, verse 23, uh, when uh, one of the disciples queries and says, how come that you will not manifest yourself to the world, but to us only? And then the, the answer of the Lord is, Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, and we love him, don't we? If a man love me, and that doesn't include the sisters, he will keep my words. There's that beautiful little 
song full of meaning, trust and obey. For there is no other way to be happy in Jesus except to trust and obey. And then it says, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. So Jesus answered, if a man love me, he will keep my words. There is obedience. And my father will love him. And we, the father and the son, will come and make our mansion with him. The word abode is the same as mansion. Can you imagine? It says, what know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have of God? So the Spirit of God indwells each of us. And here, if we love him and are obedient, the Father and the Son make their abode in this body of clay as well. How do we know? The kids answer, for the Bible tells me so. That's why. So may we come under the impact of this. I'll read verse 23 once more. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode or our mansion with him. May God grant us this state of soul that if we are found in that state of soul, offenses will have disappeared from the horizon. And the Lord Jesus will be honored as in holiness we meet for his name's sake.